verse 1, now all the people gathered together as one man. Actually, I'm going to start a little bit above that. When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra, the scribe, stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose, and beside him at his right hand stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Yerah, Hilkiah, Maasiah, and at his left hand, Pediah, Mishael, Malchiha, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshelam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatiah, Hajah, Maasiah, Kelida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This daily is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord, of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. All right, so let's go back through here and hit some points. Um, I'm sure that any of you that teach know very well how quick you can get off on rabbit trails when you start studying and unpacking these things. And um, Even though sometimes you don't have much time to prepare, you can... You can run down a lot of rabbit trails and get overwhelmed. But anyway, we're not going. We're going to try not to do that tonight. Um, so in verse one, it says, "Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel." So I think it's interesting that uh, they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded Israel. Um, so they, they, they got the, the wall built. Um, they're getting everything back in place, and it's like, okay, we're here now. Uh, we know there are requirements under the law, but we don't necessarily know what they are. Um, so they're, they're asking. So there's got to be a move of God in their hearts, stirring them. Um, as we read on, it's, it's, I don't think it just happens all of a sudden. I think it's something that the Lord had been doing in their lives. Um, but as we read on, we'll see that uh, providence um, is unmistakable in this. In verse 2, it notes that, uh, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Um, so here we also see that Ezra is a priest. He's not just a scribe, but he's also the priest. 
on the first day of the seventh month, um, we here, and because I've been brought up here, um, we've studied the feasts of God, the feasts of the Lord. One of these falls on the first day of the seventh month. Um, it's interesting, we just got through uh, in, in chapter 6, verse 15, it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul, which is the sixth month, in 52 days. So they finished it in 52 days, obviously the work of God. Um, but here we are on the first day of the seventh month, so probably five days later, you the people are asking for a holy convocation, which is what is required for the Feast of Trumpets, which falls on the first day of the seventh month. In Leviticus 23, 24, it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. Numbers 29 goes on to describe the offerings that they were to make for that feast. Um, and the uh, Feast of Trumpets, was, was, it was a shofar. I'm sure if uh, Pastor Jim was teaching tonight, he'd probably brought his <laughs> for it. But um, Verse 3. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. Before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. First thing that jumped out to me there was he read from morning, which in most uh, translations is daylight, from daylight until midday. And now, after the first hour, people are ready to cut out. <laughs> um, and it says, and the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. So for six hours, they were attentive. They were listening, paying attention. Um, and it says that they stood. That's got to be the Lord, right? <laughs> so we see they, they, the Lord's working in their hearts, obviously, and working in the, His people. So in verse 4 through verse 7, I'm going to read it first. We see that this is... Uh, a description of the service, how things went during this service. So Ezra, the scribe, stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose, and beside him, at his right hand, stood Mattathiah, Shema, Hananiah, Uriaha, Hilkiah, and Maasaiah, and at his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malkisha, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatiah, Hodijah, Maeshiah, Kelida, Azariah, Josephan, Hanan, Peliah, and the, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So twice there it tells us they stood. Um, but we see, you know, the. We, we do a lot of those similar things, right? We have a platform to stand on for people to be with. There are uh, listed names of uh, people who were serving in this gathering, in this meeting. And uh, you have, Ezra opens the book and the people stand out of reverence. Um, and For me, I still can't get over that they stood the whole six hours. I think it's great, but I think it'd be difficult to get that to happen. <laughs> but also, they read for you know, from what it sounds like to me, basically, they read straight from the scriptures for six hours. 
Although, as we go on, we'll actually we'll see, we, we as a church follow a lot of this uh, same standard, or same model. Um, verse 8. So they read distinctly from the book of the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. So they read, so apparently Ezra wasn't the only one reading. We don't have a particular list of who all read, but it was more than just Ezra. But they read distinctly from the book in the law of God. Um, and everyone who read, read distinctly or clearly. Uh, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading, uh, which is literally what it means to read distinctly, right? If you're reading it and then helping them to understand it, giving them the sense of it, uh, the context and everything, you're, you are reading it distinctly. And I think we do that here at the bridge. We have not just Pastor David who does that. We have several teaching pastors who do that. Um, verses 9 through 11. Um, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people, when they heard the words of the law, for all the people wept, <laughs> sorry, when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. So I'm, I'm reminded of Ezra 3 and 12, uh, when they laid the foundation for the temple. And the people, um, there was just a, a mix of emotions. Some people were crying. Uh, I guess some, some people view it as, the, as a weeping at the site of the new temple compared to the old temple because they had seen the original temple um, and others it says plainly were shouting for joy but we see um, in verses 10 and 11 that uh, when these people they're all they all wept I mean I'm sure even here there was a mixture of emotions you know people were Convicted, and some of them see their own sin, um, which is is a struggle. Sometimes I think the closer that you get to God, the more, or the closer that you walk with the Lord, the more you see your own sin. Sometimes, and the more it affects you. Um, and we have to be uh, we have to be able to to forgive ourselves for one, to walk away from those things, or to keep continue walking with the Lord uh, in spite of those things and it's generally not that um, we're still walking in, in nearly the, the amount of sin that we had previously walked I mean we're, we're walking closer to God we're sinning less not that we're sin less right we just sin less than we did but those sins even the smaller ones tend to 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 prick your heart more the closer that you draw to the Lord. Um, and, and so perhaps some of these people were affected by these things. And um, some of them, no doubt, were, were there completely unaware of any of the law, that unaware that, that this day that they chose to have this meeting was a, a feast to the Lord, a day that was supposed to be set aside for God. Um, and, and maybe they learned that on this day. Um, but no doubt, uh, having been slaves and having come back and to be able to hear the word again and to even start afresh, you know, that's, that's something that we even get to enjoy. <laughs> when we come back to God, when we've had a time of, of a drought in our lives and when we've um, just sometimes without realizing it have drifted from God and, and our eyes are open and we turn back, it's, it's refreshing and it's, it's, uh, it's joyous. So we see tears of joy 
So some of these people are, are weeping uh, undoubtedly for, for sadness and some for joy. But they're, they're trying to encourage them, the priests are here, um, in saying that this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. Um, and later in verse 10, it says, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So I like in that, uh, in verse 11, it says, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. So if we be still, we're calmed or we're quieted. And the day is holy, so it's, it's separated for God. It's set apart. And it's a day that we should be meditating on the good things of God. And sometimes we, we tend to be paying too much attention to where we failed and not enough attention to where God has succeeded in our lives. Um, where the, to the victories that we have in him, to the things that he's brought us through, that these people in particular would, would, would know, you know, that uh, he's brought you out of and brought you through and provided for you and he's opened up doors that people thought would never be opened again. And so you should be, this is a holy day, so you shouldn't be sorrowful, you should be meditating on the good things of God and have joy. And then it says, so be still, for the day is holy, and do not be grieved. So you, you shouldn't be caused distress on this day. So this is a way of, of encouraging the people that are listening and, and hearing these words uh, and are either convicted or, or hearing them for the first time. Um, is it, It's not a time to be sorrowful. It's not a time to uh, be meditating on the past but on the future or on the past if it is the things that the Lord has brought you through um, but you shouldn't be distressed you should be there it is in verse 11 I'm sorry it's still in verse 10 it says do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength and this uh, your joy should be anchored in that right? the joy of the Lord is your strength it is your, your stronghold. It is being able to look back at the things that he's brought you through and the things that he's provided for you. Uh, and for us, you know, the fact that Jesus died for us, that he paid a debt that we couldn't pay. So the joy of the Lord is our strength. It is, it's, it's our stronghold. It's a fortress for us when we're in those times of, of despair or in those moments or days or weeks of our lives that are, or seem like we're distant from the Lord. We feel like we're in a drought. Um, those those should be our, our fortress. That should be what we stand in and stand on. Um, and Luke 22 and 15 is my favorite version um, of the Lord's Supper, and it happens to be where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. But he says in there, um, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And so for me, he, he was... He was looking forward to, a, to his, his own death on the cross, but with joy about to eat a last meal with his disciples, even knowing what he was about to go through. Um, and when every, every time I hear the joy of the Lord, this is something that I think about. That as much as he didn't want to do it, and you know, he sweat blood, asked God if there's any other way, it was still with fervent desire have desired to eat this meal well, without eating this meal he didn't make it to the next step so it was his joy to take our place it was his joy to go to the cross and in Hebrews 12 and 2 Paul says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I'm sorry, I'm not certain that it's Paul. <laughs> he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So I don't think that at the cross was his joy. I think it was overcoming that. I think it was that he knew that he was the only spotless lamb that he had to be a willing sacrifice and the only way that he could have a relationship with us you know I heard um, Pastor David one time uh, in, a, in a I don't know if it was a married or just a couple I guess it must have been a married Bible study that uh, Pastor David sat down and he said um, Jesus did not die for your sins and it was like silent after that in the room but he said he died so that he could have a relationship with you. And it's stuck with me. I know that technically he died for our sins, right? That somebody had to pay that debt. Um, but the reason that he was willing to pay the debt was so that he could have a relationship with us. Hmm. Andrew McLaren is um, somebody most of you may not have heard much of, um, but he's an expositor. And on this topic, he had something uh, that I want to share with you that I, I thought was terrific. And he says, You are weak unless you are glad. You are not glad and strong unless your faith and hope are fixed in Christ. And unless you are working from and not towards the sense of pardon from and not toward the conviction of acceptance with God. You are weak unless you are glad. You are not glad and strong unless your faith and hope are fixed in Christ. And unless you are working from and not towards the sense of pardon, from and not towards the conviction of of acceptance with God. So, a big part of my studies recently has been um, letting go of the legalism that's it's a huge stumbling block. This is not in my notes, but we have so inter commingled, intermixed our faith and our righteousness, which is righteousness is 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 our uh, keeping of the law, right? So we got the Ten Commandments and we're trying to live that, and we're failing, but we've so joined these two things that they're not separate anymore. That we we are our own stumbling block because of it. We've lost sight of the fact that it, in order for the joy of the Lord to be my strength, I have to rely on Him and not on me. We lose sight of the fact that it's not, um, I cannot live the perfect life. I've already failed. It's too late for me to do that. It's not that I shouldn't strive to that, but as McLaren says, we should be working from the conviction of acceptance with God. So because he's accepted you, you strive to live a life worthy. And not that you strive to live a life worthy so that you will be accepted. Paul said in 2 Timothy, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. So we see other people, we tend to think, man, that dude's got a lot of faith. Paul, right? He's got a lot of faith. Well, when you realize, uh, Pastor Jim recently said it. <laughs> My sin does not separate me from God 
that how he said it? My sin does not separate me from God, but Jesus separates me from my sin. Right? So, if I've accepted him as my propitiation, as, as my spotless sacrifice, as the one who paid the price in my place, then I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. No longer working, um, trying to perform well enough to get it to please God or to, to make it into heaven. I do it to please God, but it's because I love God and because he died for me, because he paid a price that I couldn't pay. So verse 12 says, and, and all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. So this is this is our aim at the bridge, I think. It's safe to say that, that we, as a team, our pastors lead, um, is that people, when they come here, they hear the word. The word is explained to them in a way that they can understand it. Sometimes things are unpacked and brought out that there's, there's no other way you're going to find it other than digging and digging to get to it. But the goal in all of that is that people, when they leave, rejoice greatly because they understand the words that have been declared. And so, I mean, that's my hope tonight. I mean, I, there's a lot in here. There's a lot more that we could run down, but this is what the Lord is really laying on my heart is that we don't do this I'm not doing this in order to score points to get me into heaven. You shouldn't live your life that way. And Pastor David said one time, this chair right here, it's never smoked, it's never cussed, it's never drank, it's always at church, and this chair is not going to heaven. So I think there's a lot of Pastor David, I'm going to save that for later. Anyway, um, there's there's a lot of continuity. You know, um, Pastor D.A. talking about the gift. You know, we, we look for the house and the car and the wife and the two and a half kids and the picket fence, right? These are what we see as gifts. But really, the gift the gift is, is him, God himself, his sacrifice for us. And if we get that, we understand that when we leave here there's no reason to leave sad there's no reason to leave without joy there's no reason that in the worst uh, worst times of your life you can't look back and say you know what God is good I, I told you before that I, I got to go to Mississippi to serve my parents um You know, you, you, if you've never been there, you really won't understand, but there's a lot of things in life like that. I'm sure there's things that you've been through that I can never understand. But I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I, I got to spend my last few days of, of this life with them, my, my dad or, or my mother, or I got to be at their bedside when they passed away. And um, my father was diagnosed with stage four cancer and I got to not only go and serve him but work with him side by side be his hands and feet on a job site um, and I wasn't there when he passed away but I was doing the thing that the Lord had called me to do to help him and to help my mother through all of that
And there really is, there's really no way to explain how, how awesome it is to be able to, to serve like that and to watch. Um, my, in my dad's case, he, he drew closer and closer to the Lord. Um, he, he didn't, he didn't want to die. He was afraid. You know, I, I had to pick him up. I don't mean six foot four. Um, for me, a giant all my life, right? And always carried me and provided for me. And but in the end, watching him draw closer to the Lord and being able to look back and say, you know what? God is good. Even as he died, literally. God is good. Um, he he wanted to hear the song, um, God's Great Dance Floor, played at his funeral. <laughs> uh, he can't dance a lick. Well, he couldn't hear. So over there, he was planning on dancing. <laughs> um, but but it was because of those things and because of my own convictions in that that uh, my father passed away while I was here in North Carolina. And I left here and went to Mississippi back to work. Um, there was a project manager there whose father had had cancer and passed away, and she was off work for two weeks at least. So she, she stayed out for two weeks. And when she came back, you know, any little thing that, and it wasn't just because she was a woman, right? Um, but any, anything that reminded her of her father just brought her to tears. And so when I left here, I went back there and I went to work because arrangements hadn't been made. I didn't know what was going to happen, where and when. Um, so I went back to work. And the next day, I was at work. Well, it was uh, the Monday following anyway. So I was at work, and she said, what are you doing here? I said, my dad's in a better place. And so I was able to witness, but it was, it was awesome. It wasn't in my own strength, clearly. But I just had a peace that this is true that God is good that my dad is in a better place so it's not a why more I mean I, I miss him I, I love going fishing with him and used to play golf with him and you know a little bit of everything but to mourn him would be to begrudge him being in heaven if I really believe that heaven is real, believe what this book says. And she couldn't understand that. But it's true. And, and I hope that everybody, if you haven't already come to grips with that, I hope that you will. Understand that even Paul says, you know, he, he lists his pedigree and talks about his own righteousness and how he was under the law, which is righteousness is us keeping the law, is how we, well we keep the law. That's our righteousness. And he says, you know, our best righteousness is like filthy rags. <laughs> so we have no hope in our own righteousness. But we have Jesus' righteousness. It was imputed to us. And if you really understand that you have that, if you really do have that, there's no reason for there not to be joy, even in, in death, in the face of death, even in a valley when you're struggling. You should still be able to have that joy. So I'm going to pray real quick and wrap things up. I don't have any. I guess we got about 15 minutes or so that I'll let Tom have. <laughs>